So thank you everyone for, uh, for joining for this uh, special Grand Rounds. Uh, we were talking uh, a couple months ago about how to really um, uh, be able to showcase some of our uh, fantastic faculty who were able to very rapidly publish in, of course, this, this brand new area for all of us in COVID-19. So uh, we hope you enjoyed this Grand Rounds with, uh, with three great speakers. So I'll just briefly introduce uh, all three of them up front to save some time um, on the back end, and, uh, and then we'll get started. So Dr. Iacobel, uh, Gianluca Iacobelis is a professor of medicine here at the University in the Division of Endocrinology. Um, is also, direct, also the director of the diabetes service at our tower. Um, he uh, earned his medical degree um, and his PhD at the University of Rome in Italy, where he specialized in endocrinology and metabolic disorders. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Juan Bur uh, Burguenio is a, a postdoc in uh, Maria Abreu's lab in the Division of Digestive Health. He earned his veterinary and PhD degree at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Um, and at that, um, at that location, he was working on things like toll-like receptors and in, in intestinal inflammation and therapeutic targets of biologics and murine models of IBD, which he has um, done a great job translating here um, at the University of Miami. And finally, Dr. Gilberto Lopes is a professor of medicine in the, in the Division of Medical Oncology, also is the Director for International Programs and the Associate Director of Global Oncology at Sylvester. Um, he earned his degree, his medical degree at the Federal University of Rio Grande uh, do Sul in Brazil and did his residency and fellowship training here at the University of Miami and was a chief resident here as well, uh, actually while when I was an intern. So we have three great speakers lined up for you and we will uh, be getting started with Dr. Iacobelis. Thanks for joining. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. So let me share my... Uh, can you can you see? Yes. All right. Okay. So um, yeah, when I I was invited to uh, to to give this uh, grand round presentation a couple of months ago, I uh, actually did not anticipate that this lecture would be so up to date. Um, so I'm going to present you uh, what we did, uh, what we in the past uh, two three months, uh, uh, and uh, what the evidence about the uh, the interaction between the adipose tissue and the COVID-19. So first of all, and this is a very very again up to date. So uh, emerging and uh, very recent data um, uh, are showing that obesity seems to be one of the major risk factors for COVID-19 complications. Um, and uh, so there are several studies, including uh, uh, studies from our group, uh, showing that obesity is an independent uh, risk factor for COVID-19 complications. Why is that? There are several uh, reasons why uh, obesity uh, uh, is a risk factor for COVID-19 complication. And one of these is definitely the fact that obesity by itself and, um, uh, is in a highly inflammatory uh, condition. And uh, we, we understand that the COVID-19 has this uh, peculiarity of this uh, exaggerated uh, uh, inflammatory response. So the, the intrinsic inflammatory uh, status of the, uh, uh, that we observe uh, in, in people with uh, obesity uh, is definitely a perfect milieu for the uh, COVID-19 to develop uh, cardiovascular respiratory complications. But not only that, so we also uh, know that uh, there are some receptors are involved in the COVID-19 spread uh, through the body, and that uh, these receptors, particularly the C2 and also the DPP4, uh, are uh, expressed by the adipose tissue. And that's also there is another reason why obesity may be a, a strong contributor to the COVID-19 complication. And also uh, the fact that um, the adipose tissue by itself may serve a reservoir for the virus by itself. This has been observed for other viruses like HIV in the past, but seems to be uh, true also for the COVID-19. And uh, and uh, an additional uh, uh, reason why obesity is a risk factor for COVID-19 complications is the fact that, as I'm going to present you and show you later, uh, the, uh, the visceral deposit, so the, um, the intra-organ and uh, um, fat accumulation seems to be uh, a key factor into play 
a major role. So there are multiple uh, reasons uh, why obesity is a, a risk factor for COVID-19 complications. Um, what is also emerging very, very recently that uh, the, the, the newer cases uh, the, that we are seeing uh, particularly are affecting a much younger uh, um, population. And uh, from the, these uh, data from the John Hopkins uh, University, we can appreciate that there is a, a very um, unusual uh, negative correlation between age and body mass index in the COVID-19 admission to the emergency department. So we are seeing that most of the people uh, um, referring to the emergency department with the COVID-19 uh, uh, symptoms and actually with being positive for COVID-19 are patients uh, much younger and uh, with a higher body mass index. So, um, and this is consistent also in uh, uh, our uh, state. So this is a very um, up-to-date uh, uh, data from, the, from Florida. You can uh, absolutely see that uh, the, the highest percentage of cases in the past two weeks is uh, for the uh, age category between 25 and 34. So, and uh, uh, it's good then to know that um, the, the rate that in this uh, uh, age category is still very low, but it's surprising that uh, unlike that we observed in March and April and in Europe, uh, so now the, the more prevalent uh, uh, patients with COVID-19 are much younger patients and patients with uh, obesity. Uh, so we also, as I say, they found that uh, it's not just obesity, but it's actually the visceral obesity that can predict, uh, can increase the risk of the COVID-19 uh, 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 complications. So we, we commented uh, recently in obesity that the visceral obesity seems to be the key component and not just obesity. And there are several factors and several reasons, including the fact that, as you can see, the visceral obesity comes with a higher DPP4 uh, expression, a lower GLP1 expression, and a lower AC2 expression, and a higher angiotensin 2 expression within the adipose tissue. And all of these receptors that play a key role in uh, the COVID-19 uh, spread uh, and uh, in the ability of the, the body to respond to the virus. And also uh, they play a role in the, in, uh, the exaggerated inflammatory in immune response. However, we also know that the COVID-19 has a strong uh, cardiovascular involvement, particularly uh, affecting the, the, the myocardium. It's been reported in several, several cases of the myocarditis. It seems to be peculiar in patients uh, absolutely with no history of coronary disease, healthy, that develop uh, a lethal or very serious uh, myocardial inflammation. And so we, we thought that the epicardial adipose tissue may play a role. So uh, this is, uh, I, did, I dedicate most of my research to the epicardial adipose tissue, which is the, uh, the, the true visceral adipose tissue, the heart, uh, which is in direct contiguity with the myocardium with no uh, uh, obstacle. In fact, you can appreciate here from the microscopic appearance that the, the, the epicardial adipose tissue is in direct contiguity with the myocardium and they share the same microcirculation. So the, the, the cytokines uh, um, uh, produced by the epicardial adipose tissue can go directly into the myocardium via basa basorum. And what is very striking and interesting, particularly in the COVID-19 setting, that the epicardial adipose tissue is a highly inflammatory fat depot. So this is, uh, uh, you can see, you can appreciate that the epicardial adipose tissue as compared to the sacrotaneous adipose tissue has a very dense inflammatory infiltrate, uh, mostly with the T cells and uh, M1 macrophages. And not only uh, the epicardial fat secretes uh, inflammatory cytokines, but uh, is highly rich in uh, genes involve the inflammation and endothelial uh, dysfunction and coagulation. All factors uh, extremely important uh, for the development of the COVID-19 uh, cardiovascular or respiratory uh, uh, serious complications. So what we hypothesize, uh, what we, uh, we think and uh, that the epicardial tissue uh, 
plays uh, uh, a direct role in the COVID-19 and my, my pericarditis. So because all of these uh, um, characteristics, so the intrinsic uh, inflammatory activity, the epicardial tissue uh, can play a significant role in the myocarditis. You can see here on the left, the COVID-19 negative patients, and here COVID-19 positive and epicardial tissue has a high inflammatory infiltrate. So clinically, you can measure with the technique that I developed the epicardial uh, adipose tissue, and uh, you can uh, appreciate here that the epicardial adipose tissue can measure with a simple uh, ultrasound. And clinically, the cases have been reported with the my my pericarditis, uh, showing that there is a uh, increase. Um, you can see here the high brightness of the epicardial adipose tissue with the ultrasound. So not only <clears throat> from the pathological perspective, but also from the clinical uh, perspective, uh, you can easily detect uh, the uh, increased inflammation within the epicardial tissue in patients with the COVID-19. Here you can see the high bright uh, signal in the epicardial adipose tissue in the patients with, uh, uh, who develop COVID-19 and myocarditis. Uh, so also the epicardial tissue can be measured with the CT scan and uh, this also give you uh, uh, an, uh, an additional very important information about the, the density. So the, the adipose tissue uh, with, uh, can be measured with the, with the CT and the CT uh, um, can uh, um, detect the density which is a marker of inflammation. What uh, we found that, that uh, patients uh, with the COVID-19 had an abnormal uh, CT measure epicardial fat density. So the HU attenuation, which is the marker indicating uh, the, um, the density, so uh, namely the inflammation of the adipose tissue, in this case of the epicardial adipose tissue, can be an excellent marker to uh, indicate, reflect the epicardial adipose tissue inflammation in patients with the COVID-19. And uh, what is very striking uh, that uh, we found uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the CT measure epicardial adipose tissue density, again, reflecting uh, in the inflammatory status of this adipose tissue, uh, uh, was uh, higher uh, with uh, increasing the severity of the COVID-19. So the more severe, the more critical was the patient, uh, the more dense and inflamed was the CT measure epicardial adipose tissue. So, um, so these data are uh, highly suggesting that the uh, epicardial adipose tissue uh, uh, can be at the same time a marker of the uh, inflammatory status in patients with the COVID-19 and can be a predictor of the severity of the COVID-19 complications. So because this is, is, a, um, is an imaging test that could be uh, performed in the patients uh, who are going to be admitted for COVID-19, and uh, this may serve as a reliable uh, marker of the uh, a predictor of the COVID-19 complications. Uh, what is interesting is that we found that the, 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 the value of the density, so the HU uh, uh, value, again reflecting the density, the inflammation of the epicardial tissue, was similar in COVID patients uh, to uh, that we found in patients with coronary artery disease, which are well known to have a highly inflammatory status within the epicardial tissue. That means that uh, so the inflammatory status uh, within the epicardial tissue in COVID-19 patients and mostly in those with severe and critical COVID-19 is similar to the inflammation that you have in patients with a coronary artery disease. Even these, the COVID-19 patients were free of a coronary artery disease. Another interesting aspect of the epicardial tissue and its potential role in the COVID-19 complication is the fact that the epicardial tissue expresses AC Two, which is uh, well recognized as the entry receptor for the COVID-19. The COVID uh, and what is interesting is that um, the, uh, when you knock down the, the ACT2 
uh, uh, within the epicardiopest tissue, there is an increase in the inflammation. You can see, so uh, the AC2 uh, loss increase inflammatory markers. On the contrary, when you uh, enhance the AC2 uh, expression with the angiotensin 1-7, you have a reduction in the epicardiopest tissue inflammation. So that can open uh, the, um, the opportunity to uh, to see if we can pharmacologically modulate the epicardial lipid tissue and uh, uh, particularly its AC2 receptor and uh, whether this could uh, have some impact in reducing uh, the COVID-19 uh, complications. Um, I also found um, uh, a potential interest to the fact that the DPP4 uh, um, enzymes uh, may be uh, somehow involved in the COVID-19 complications. The DPP-4 uh, played a key role in MERS, uh, as was the entry receptor for MERS. Some studies uh, uh, showing that this is also uh, possible for COVID-19, even it definitely is not the main receptor, maybe a co-receptor, maybe a decoy receptor. So, However, I was intrigued by the fact that the DPP4 and its inhibition may uh, have some role uh, in the COVID-19. So uh, we started uh, a clinical protocol at the University of Miami uh, Hospital to see if uh, uh, diabetic patients uh, may benefit from adding the DPP4 inhibitors uh, if they are infected with the COVID-19. We have uh, we just started with, with we have uh, very preliminary results. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the, uh, the DPP4 inhibitions uh, may increase GLP-1, and uh, because we know that the epicardial tissue responds based on my studies very well and uh, to the GLP-1 analogs because express actually the GLP-1 receptors. So the, the hypothesis that the DPP4 inhibitions uh, may reduce uh, the epicardial deposition inflammation uh, in patients with uh, diabetes and COVID-19. Um, definitely, so the hyperglycemia, regardless of diabetes, or, uh, plays a key role in the uh, COVID-19 complications. What we found and published from patients admitted that you have power, that the uh, the day one hyperglycemia, so the, the glucose levels on, on the first day of admission in patients with the, with the COVID-19 uh, was a major predictor of the, of the uh, SARS, of the respiratory distress. You can see that on your right of your screen, you have patients with uh, severe hyperglycemia at the, at the admission who develop uh, serious and unfortunately die by uh, SARS. And what is interesting is that the, the uh, day one uh, glucose levels uh, is a predictor of um, respiratory complications, regardless of the previous or persistent history of the diabetes. And uh, uh, going back to obesity, most of these patients were obese, and the hyperglycemia uh, um, served as a predictor of, of complications, again, independently of the pre-existing diabetes history. So, to yeah, summarize, two, yes. two minutes. If you don't mind. Yeah, uh, this is the last one. Yes. So, yeah. To summarize, um, my uh, my recent interest uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, COVID nineteen and, and uh, obesity, we can say that the this issue may be a player in the myocardial inflammation, and uh, at the same time a marker of inflammation and potentially a therapeutic target. Uh, certainly, the uh, recent rise in, in cases that we are seeing, that which is very likely multifactorial, uh, accounts for younger and uh, uh, patients with visceral obesity, and uh, this uh, may open the opportunity to do preventive uh, actions uh, to uh, identify these uh, patients at a potentially higher risk of complications. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cabellas, you're in clinic, right? So maybe we can take um, a question or two now. If oh, yes, can... yes, of course. That would be great. Thank you very much. Yes. Would anyone like to unmute and ask a question? Um, hey, 
Amr and Gianluca. Benissimo, yeah. that was so interesting. Um, I, I know it's not as practical, perhaps, and as easy, but you, you would assume that mesenteric fat would follow the same phenomenon? I know the implications are sort of different in terms of the cardiovascular things, but do you think mesenteric fat is also undergoing these changes, Gianluca? Yeah, definitely. So thank you for your, for your uh, question. I think that definitely so any visceral fat depot, including mesenteric fat, uh, uh, is uh, uh, can play uh, can uh, uh, express uh, um, highly inflammatory cytokines and genes, and definitely could be also involved uh, in uh, uh, other complications. For example, uh, some of these patients uh, develop acute renal failure or uh, acute um, uh, unexpected uh, gastrointestinal uh, uh, complications. So certainly, the mesenteric uh, adipose tissue may be involved too. What is peculiar for the epicardial adipose tissue that uh, the direct contiguity with the myocardium, which it does not apply to other visceral adipose tissue, including the mesenteric. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bruguenio, you ready? Okay. Okay, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm not muted, right? No. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So, so today uh, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna I'm gonna be presenting to, uh, and talking to you about uh, this paper that we published uh, in the expression of SARS coronavirus two entry molecules. Uh, in oh, let me. Yeah. In uh, in the uh, in the in these entry molecules so for SARS coronavirus two AC two as uh, Dr. Yakovalis has introduced and TMP RSS two in the guard of patients uh, with IBD and uh, I, I'm sure that uh, that COVID nineteen does not require uh, an introduction in this audience but uh, let me remind you that uh, COVID nineteen patients also report digestive symptoms and here you can see uh, three different studies on three of the first studies that reported uh, in, a, in a large uh, cohort of patients uh, that uh, 11 to 56% of uh, COVID-19 patients uh, developed these uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, <clears throat> uh, which include lack of appetite, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, and abdominal pain. And as you can see, these symptoms can appear alone or in concomitancy with, uh, the, with respiratory symptoms. So, <clears throat> These findings and taken together with the fact that SARS coronavirus RNA can be detected in the stool of COVID-19 patients, and especially in those patients that have digestive symptoms, led to the hypothesis that SARS, that SARS coronavirus 2 could potentially infect the gut. And actually this hypothesis has been demonstrated by, by a group that, or by a study that showed uh, in green, you can see here, by, that they immunolocalized the viral nucleocapsid uh, protein of the virus in epithelial cells of the duodenum and of the rectum. And, la and later studies have shown that uh, um, actually uh, SARS coronavirus 2 can, uh, can replicate in, uh, in vitro in uh, cultures of epithelial cells. So, um, so if we think or, or uh, we think uh, how can uh, this virus infect uh, the gut? If we take a look at the mechanism of infection, there's two main proteins that are involved in the, in the interaction between the virus and the host. And these two proteins are angiotensin 1 converting enzyme 2 or AC2 and transmembrane serine protease 2 and TMP RSS2. So AC2 works as a receptor and binds by homology the S protein of the, of the coronavirus. And TMPRSS2 performs a proteolytic cleavage of this S protein. And when this, uh, when, when this cleavage is done, there's a subunit of the S protein that is uh, exposed that uh, mediates the membrane fusion between the virus and the, and the, cell, uh, and the host cell. If we take a look at the expression of these two proteins in, in, uh, in available and publicly available data sets, such as the Human Protein Atlas, we can see that, that AC2 has a high expression in the small intestine and a good, I mean, a fair expression in the, in the large intestine. 
and, and for instance, especially that, that expression is high when you compare it to other target organs as the lung. And as you can see here, the, the pattern of, of expression of this, of AC2 is uh, basically epithelial. If we do the same for TMPRSS2, we can see that it's also expressed in the gastrointestinal tract. And again, it's, uh, it's basically expressed in epithelial cells. So all, taken together, all this data suggests that the virus uh, can infect uh, uh, intestinal epithelial cells. So working in Dr. Abreu's lab, focuses on the study of inflammatory bowel diseases, which as you know, are characterized by chronic and relapsing inflammation, and that can occur uh, throughout the whole gastrointestinal tract in the case of Crohn's disease, or uh, particularly in the colon in the case of ulcerative colitis. The pathogenesis of these diseases is not fully understood, but uh, and what we know is that the patients require anti-inflammatory medication uh, to control flares and maintain remission. So at the time we started uh, working on this project, uh, uh, we, we, there, there was no data available on how inflammation or the anti-inflammatory medication could affect the expression of HC2 and TMPRSS2, uh, and therefore uh, if they could uh, affect uh, the risk of developing coronavirus. So the first thing we did, as Dr. Despandi said, uh, uh, my, my expertise is uh, animal models, <clears throat> So was characterizing the expression of uh, AC2 and TMPRSS2 in mice in steady state conditions. So we isolated a whole tissues from the duodenum, the ileum, and the colon of these mice and uh, characterized the expression of both genes by qPCR. And, uh, and first of all, we wanted to know if the levels of expression of these genes were high, intermediate, or low. And to do so, what we usually do is normalize the expression of these genes to the expression of a highly expressed uh, structural gene, which is uh, beta, beta active. So usually, if your, if your gene has a high expression, it will show up in the qPCR before or five cycles after uh, beta active. And if it has an intermediate expression, it will show up between five and 15 cycles. So as you can see here, uh, AC2, which you can see in white bars, had a high expression in the duodenum and ileum, whereas uh, TMPRSS2 uh, had a high expression in the colon. Then we normalized these results for relative expression, and, and we again observed that duodenum was the place or with the maximal expression of AC2, and this expression was progressively reduced as we, as we moved uh, towards the colon. And for TMPRSS2, the highest expression was found in the colon. So given that this, uh, um, that these uh, genes are, are majorly expressed in intestinal epithelial cells. We isolated uh, intestinal epithelial cells from on all these sections and we performed the same studies and saw again um, uh, AC2 and, and was highly expressed in duodenum and ileum and uh, TMPRSS2 was highly expressed in colon but also duodenum. So our next approach uh, was um, to determine uh, if, if uh, or we compared the expression of these genes in epithelial cells to the expression of, of, of these same genes in, uh, in whole tissues. And we always observed that there was a significant increase in the expression of both genes in epithelial cells. So these data demonstrate that epithelial cells are the main source of this, uh, or, or the main cells expressing these proteins. Therefore, from this moment on, we started working in epithelial cells and first of all, um, to, to investigate how inflammation influences the expression of these genes, and we induced acute inflammation um, by uh, feeding our mice uh, with DSS, which is a, um, a polysaccharide that thins the, uh, the inner mucus layer and therefore uh, allows for the, for the colonization of the lamina propria with the luminal bacteria. And that triggers an inflammatory response. So we isolated intestinal epithelial cells at different time points and determined the expression of IL-1 beta, which is a pro-inflammatory gene. And by days four and six after inflammation of DSS, you can see how this pro-inflammatory gene increased its expression. And by these same days, there was a, a marked down regulation of AC2. And here in this graph, you can see that by day six, there was no changes uh, in, the, in the expression of AC2. So we decided to take all this data and perform a, um, a correlation between the expression of AC2 
and the expression of IL-1 beta. And we saw that the high, uh, or as inflammation occurs, there's a down regulation of AC2. So to corroborate these findings in chronic models of inflammation, uh, we search for databases uh, with gene expression in, uh, in tissues. And in this case, we found databases on IL-10 knockout mice, which develop spontaneous chronic inflammation, and RAC1 knockout mice that when they are engrafted with naive T cells from wild-type mice, also develop chronic inflammation. And in these data sets, again, we retrieved the expression of IL-1 beta, and we saw that the mice developed inflammation, and we either saw a down regulation of AC2 or no alterations in the expression of both genes. So this data uh, suggests that uh, in mouse models, uh, inflammation downregulates epithelial AC2. So next, we, we move to, to, to the human, right? So we start to determine uh, whether uh, the expression of these antimolecules is affected uh, in, in biopsies of IBD patients. And again, we took a, a, a bioinformatics approach and analyzed the expression uh, of, of AC2 and TMPRSS2 in the in mucosal biopsies uh, from a data set that uh, included 11 control subjects, eight active uh, Crohn's disease patients, 74 active UC and 23 inactive UC patients. And in all, in this, this was a microarray, and what we observed was, was that neither active Crohn's disease nor active or inactive ulcerative colitis uh, showed any alterations in the expression of these genes. So next, uh, uh, we sought to corroborate our, our findings in our own samples. And in this case, uh, we repurposed an ongoing project that we had in the lab in which we had enrolled uh, 31 patients, uh, 15 for UC, uh, 16 for, for CD, and 15 males, uh, 16 females, most of them white, Hispanic, and non-Hispanics, and in different medications. Our clinicians at the Crohn's and Colitis Center collected biopsies from inflamed and non-inflamed areas that underwent an initial step of depletion of epithelial cells, which are the main cells that we usually find in the biopsies. And still you can see that although we perform depletion, there's expression of epithelial cell genes in our samples. And by using a magnetic activated cell sorting, we try to enrich for CD11B cells. And CD11B cells are essentially phagocytes, such as neutrophils, um, uh, dendritic cells, and macrophages that are usually minority uh, in these types of samples unless there's inflammation. So we perform RNA isolation from these samples. We sequence this RNA and we retrieve the expression of AC2 and TMPRSS2. And what we observed in these samples is that uh, there were differences uh, between the, the localization, like AC2 again was higher in the ileum than in the colon and TMPRSS2 looked higher in the colon than in the ileum. But still, we were not able to find any differences between non-inflamed and inflamed patients. So taken together with our previous data, uh, uh, with the biopsy data set, the, the, uh, these findings indicate that inflammation in IBD patients does not alter the expression of these uh, sars cov entry molecules. So finally, we analyzed the expression of, uh, of this, both these molecules stratified by age, gender, ethnicity and race, and we saw no differences. But when we stratified our patients by, by the medication that we're receiving, we saw that AC2 was significantly downregulated by the use of uh, anti-TNFs, anti-integrin, anti-IL-12, IL-23, and steroid drugs. And also we saw that uh, IL-12, uh, IL IL-23, uh, Anti-IL-12, IL-23 drugs diminish the expression of TMPRSS2, but anti-integrins uh, could uh, in enhance the expression of this receptor. So taken together, all these findings uh, suggest that IBD medication could reduce the risk of infection from uh, sars cov 2 throughout the gut. So from our data, uh, we can conclude that neither inflammation nor IBD medications increase the expression of, uh, the of these viral entry molecules in the gut. And therefore, we anticipated that patients with IBD are not at increased risk of, of infection from uh, sars cov virus too. So just as a quick update, I, I wanted to um, comment on this letter to the editor that we received uh, citing our work in which Aziz and colleagues uh, um, estimated the incidence of COVID-19 in IBD patients 
by performing a meta-analysis that included studies uh, from uh, France, Italy, Spain, uh, China, and the United States. And they estimated the incidence of COVID-19 uh, in the IBD population to be of 0.3% in, in an important cohort of patients. And that is at the lower end of the, of the, of the incidence uh, of COVID-19 in the general population. And finally, if you just have a special interest uh, in this topic, that there is a website that's committed to the epidemiologic surveillance of COVID-19 in IBD patients, uh, which is called Secure IBD. And there you can report cases and check, uh, and you can analyze their data, stratified by countries, um, types of uh, UCCD and medications. And finally, I just wanted to, to thank uh, uh, and acknowledge the, all the people that collaborated in this work, especially Dr. Abreu, because she really pushed the, uh, put this study forward from the very beginning and we did it really quick, uh, thanks to her. All the clinicians at the Crohn's and Colitis Center, the people at the UM Oncogenomic Shared Resource, the bioinformaticians at the Scripps Research Institute in Florida, and at the Biostatistics and Bioinformatics Research Resource at the Sylvester, and of course our funding agencies. And uh, that's it, I'll be happy to take questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, any questions? We have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, Juan, this is Mario Stevenson, um, infectious disease. Um, if you're seeing an infection of gut epithelial cells, do you think the integrity of the gut mucosa is being compromised? So in other words, if you were to look for a correlation between viral nucleic acid in stool and plasma LPS, for example, would you see a correlation? Uh... I don't think that uh, that there's a uh, mm, that the that the epithelial uh, that the epithelium is compromised because this uh, like both these molecules are are are, are, are expressed there, right? So, so the 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 interaction between the virus, uh, and given the, the the size of the of the particles of the virus, shouldn't shouldn't be too complicated to 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 traverse the mucous layers and and directly interact with the with the epithelial cells. Uh, uh, if uh, once if you have uh, if you have some in inflammation and depending on the microbiome, uh, well, uh, the microbiome of course uh, can definitely affect uh, how how your epithelial cells are going to behave. So, and it's been shown actually in a in a recent study that that I, that we uh, reviewed uh, that uh, that the microbiome indeed increases the expression of AC2. But in this case, inflammation reduces it. So uh, we should see the other conditions. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, our, uh, thank you so much, Joan. Our last uh, presentation is uh, from Dr. Lopes. Hi, everybody. Let me just start. The slideshow, there we go. Can everybody see the slideshow? Yeah, yeah. I'll take that as a yes. So the title of my presentation is From a Tweet to the Lancet in 10 Weeks, the COVID-19 in Cancer Consortium Registry. Uh, this has been a very interesting three months. Everybody has been involved in what's going on with COVID-19. And from the beginning of the- Dr. Dr. Wilson, I'm sorry, you're, you're, uh, we see your like speaker present, like the speaker mode, not the presentation mode. So we can see the next slide as well. Let me share, share screen. Let's pick the right screen up. Yeah. How about now? Perfect. Thank you. So from the beginning of the pandemic, we imagined that patients with cancer would be at a higher risk of complications and death due to increased age, comorbidities, uh, to the amount of time that patients actually spend in the healthcare system, as well as because of decreased immunity due to cancer or its treatments, or because patients have poor performance status as well. And this is the tweet that launched a thousand ships. Dr. Desai was then a resident at, uh, in Connecticut. He's now a first year hematology oncology fellow at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And this is what we knew back in March when the pandemic reached the US, that a small study with about 17 patients from uh, China had made it to the Lancet Oncology, suggesting that patients with cancer had higher mortality, but that's pretty much 
what we had in terms of um, actual um, uh, real data. That led us to start a crowdsourcing um, effort to try to put together a group of colleagues and centers who would be willing to contribute patients to a registry. And from that tweet, we got into the COVID-19 and cancer consortium. This is Dr. Desai, and with colleagues from uh, Aurora Health, Harvard, uh, Washington, us, and Vanderbilt, we put together this initial consortium that now has more than 100 centers and has contributed about 3,000 patients. This is the presentation we made, and I'm gonna be driving, uh, driving mine from this. This is the presentation we made at ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Annual Scientific Meeting in May this year. And this is the data set that was published at the Lancet on the same day. By May, when we actually did the data cut for this presentation, we already had more than 100 centers participating. And you can see how quickly that actually happened in the beginning of April, we pretty much through the month of April grew by leaps and bounds. And these are the methods. The, these cases were accrued during the first 30 days of the registry operation. We had set that up as our initial plan. Patients needed to have PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2 to be analyzed. The primary outcome was 30-day all-cause mortality. And we looked at secondary outcomes that have been seen as important um, endpoints as well. We determined the potential prognostic variables a priority and evaluated with logistic regression with partial adjustments and multi-imputation for missingness of data as would be expected in a crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing effort. We also did exploratory analysis with elastic net regularized logistic regression and I would be caught um, empty-handed if you asked me to explain what that actually is. These are the 10,035 completed cases over the timeline between March 17th and April 16th, 2020, uh, representing the first 30 days in the study. We, of these 1,035 registries, we had to exclude 22 because they either had inside a carcinoma or uh, patients were outside of what we had been allowed to enter in our IRB approval. Uh, the cohort after exclusions was about 1,000 patients. We, for this first analysis, excluded non-lab confirmed COVID-19 cases, and that brought us to about 928 patients for the final analysis. This is baseline characteristics, as we'd expect for patients with cancer in general, half men, half women, and the um, median age was 66 years with a range that would be expected for patients with cancer in the US and Western Europe. This is our ratio ethnic distribution. In green, we see patients in the registry. In blue is what would be expected for the population surveyed on a census-based proportion. We see that we had uh, fewer patients who were um, white in our registry, a few more than expected black or African-American, a few less than expected as Hispanic and um, a few more expected in others, that's mostly Asians. And this is the geographic distribution. Most cases in the first month of the registry were in the Northeast, 40%, um, most actually in New York. We also had 5% of patients in Canada and 7% in Spain. Types of malignancy, most patients had solid tumors, 82% of these breast, prostate, and gastrointestinal were most common. Thoracic were not as common because patients were being encouraged to fill a different registry, which is specific for lung cancer patients. 22% of patients had immunologic malignancies and 12% had multiple cancers. In terms of performance status and how they were doing in their cancer journey, most patients had a performance status of 0 or 1 by ECOG, 8% uh, PS of 2, 5% of 3 or 4, and data were missing for 19% of patients. As for cancer status, 48%, almost half of the patients were in remission or had no active disease. A third had disease that was present but stable responding. 12% had disease that was progressing and data were missing for 7%. These are our main results. 13% uh, of the patients entered in the database died. 12% required mechanical ventilation. 14% were admitted to the ICU. 26% uh, had the composite outcome of death, severe illness requiring hospitalization, ICU admission, or mechanical ventilation. 
and about half of the patients were hospitalized. Here we compare the mortality for some selected subgroups within the registry to what has been shown uh, worldwide. So global statistics suggest that for patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19, we have about 6% mortality. For those patients in our cohort who did not have any comorbidities and had no symptoms uh, before the diagnosis of COVID-19, these patients had a 0% chance of dying. Um, men had about a 17% chance of dying. Those over the age of 75, 25%. And um, looking at the end of the table, those patients that had an ECO performance status of two or more and were intubated, there was a mortality rate of 85%. When we look at the statistical analysis, these are the factors that were associated with 30-day all-cause mortality. We saw an odds ratio, adjusted odds ratio of 1.84 for older age by decade. Uh, male sex, former versus never smoker, ECOG performance status of two versus zero one, um, cancer that was present but stable, cancer present but progressing, or the use of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin all actually put patients at a higher risk in this registry. Um, it's important to notice that the most important risk factor was actually if the patients had cancer that was present and progressing. Here we look at some of the factors that were not associated, or at least in this first analysis, did not reach statistical significance. Non-Hispanic blacks versus non-Hispanic whites, there was no difference. I do need to present this with a caveat. Now with 2,600 patients in the analysis, we're gonna show something different at the ACR meeting um, in about a week or so. Obesity was not associated, but again, this is specifically for patients with cancer. Hematologic malignancies versus solid tumor, there was a trend, but there was no statistical significant difference. And the type of cancer treatment did not matter for outcomes, at least in this initial analysis of 900 patients. Summary and conclusions for this specific presentation that we did at ASCO was that patients with cancer and COVID-19 do have high rates of death and complications. General factors related to patients as well as cancer-specific factors were associated with uh, increased mortality, and those were male sex, older age, eco performance status of two or more, and progressing cancer. And of course, we can only make any um, conclusions about the use of hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin based on clinical trials that are still ongoing. As of the third data log that was about a little bit more than a week ago on June 26, we had about 3,000 surveys, and we're going to have a new analysis with 2,700 patients that I'll be presenting at the European meeting in about a month and a half. Before I finish and conclude, I just want to show a few of the other registries that have started. This is Teravo, the specific registry in lung cancer, showing mortality of 35.5% for patients with lung cancer who developed COVID-19. We are now collaborating with the European Society of Medical Oncology and their registry and ours will be merged for analysis once they do have data. The American Society of Hematology has a specific registry now for hematologic malignancies. And the American Society of Clinical Oncology also has a specific survey and solid tumor registry. This is the study that we hope will give us some more insight, not just in terms of what happens to patients clinically, but also on biomarkers. We do have data collected on simple labs, including um, cardiac markers, as well as inflammation markers that were done routinely in some of the centers that participate in the registry. But the NCI has put together this longitudinal natural history study in which there will be a lot more uh, biomarker correlates and this study is now open and enrolling in a number of centers across the country. In conclusion for COVID-19 and cancer, we now have several ongoing registries collecting data and we're starting to see the initial reported outcomes. Mortality rates for patients with cancer when they develop COVID-19 seems to be higher than in the general population, especially so in lung cancer patients. Both cancer-related factors and factors unrelated to malignancy can influence mortality. And as I mentioned, we hope that the NCI prospective NCC APS study and CAPS will provide longitudinal biomarker data so that we can understand more the relationship between COVID-19 and cancer. Let me stop sharing here so we still have time for a few questions.
Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's open for questions. Um, Gilberto, what about um, checkpoint inhibitors? We, so we looked at that and with the thousand patient mark, there was no association with worse outcomes. Um, uh, most of the other registries have showed similar results, although there's one discrepant result suggesting that patients in immunotherapy have worse outcomes. Um, I can tell you without showing the data that with 2,600 patients, we don't have any association between immunotherapy and uh, worse outcomes. We have, um, in, in IVD, actually, the anti-TNFs and anti-IL-1223 actually show a minimally protective effect Interesting. When, when you can, when you actually look at all the age match stuff, other things like JAK inhibitors, like we, we only use tofacitinib at the moment, mm -hmm. but tofacitinib and the thiopurines actually have a higher rate of mortality. Interesting. So it's been trying to get people off of some of those in some cases. And these are some of the interesting implications of our study and the other registries showing that for cancer patients, it is the cancer that is the most important terminal prognosis. So we should definitely do everything we can to continue diagnosing and treating patients during the pandemic. Gilberto, hi, this is uh, Joe. So it, it, as best I can tell, we're doing something almost opposite from this at the present time, which is that we're screening for COVID and then on the basis of that screening, deciding not to treat or to delay treatment. That's an important point because technically while you do have your COVID-19, actually while you are infected, you should not be getting any treatment. So what I mentioned is we should not stop and move the healthcare system from keeping patients away while we have the pandemic. Um, all of these patients that were entering the registry, they did not get active treatment while having the infection. What I'm mentioning about active treatment is just before they got diagnosed and what the cancer status was before their diagnosis. So the main point with this is that we're not gonna give chemo for somebody that is currently admitted with COVID-19. We have to wait as we would with an infection for the patient to recover. But once we know um, that the pandemic is here, we should not stop treating our patients just because we have the virus in the community. So that's the main message. I'm sorry if that wasn't quite clear. Okay, great. Seeing no more questions. Uh, thank you guys all very much for joining and we will be resuming grand rounds uh, in this regular format in a couple of months. Have a, have a great summer and stay safe. All right. Have a good summer, everyone. Bye-bye.